My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin. I have degrees in archaeology and ancient history from Queen's University, Belfast. My subject is the Roman economy, including trade beyond the imperial frontiers. I have published several books on this subject. The question is, why were the ancient Romans in the Crimea? You can read about this subject in my book, The Roman Empire and the Silk Routes. This is part four of a lecture on Greek and Roman voyages in the Black Sea. I delivered this talk to the Classical Association of Northern Ireland at Queen's University Belfast in November 2018. I gave an earlier version of this lecture to the Classical Association of Ireland in Cork University in summer 2017. The lecture was prompted by the recent discovery of intact ancient Greek and Roman shipwrecks in the Black Sea. The ancient Crimea was a major supplier of grain to the Greco-Roman world, and the region had a long history of trade contact, settlements and engagement with classical civilization. Sailing north from Sebastopolis, Greek ships passed along a coastline that had many well-known mooring places and natural harbours. This coast led to the Taman Peninsula, which enclosed the Sea of Azov. By the Roman era, the Taman Peninsula was part of the Crimean Kingdom, and it was another important grain-producing territory with a regional capital called Phanagoria that had Greek origins. The Karak Strait between the Crimean and the Taman Peninsulas allowed passage into the enclosed Azov Sea. Passage through the strait was controlled by the Hellenic city of Panticapaeum on the Crimean shore. Strabo refers to Panticapaeum as the metropolis, capital of the Chersonensis, and Pliny describes it as the strongest city in the region. The city was built around an acropolis and had a harbour with docks for about 30 ships. Pliny estimated that the distance between Panticapaeum and Phanagoria on the far side of the strait was barely four miles, and this is all the width that separates Asia from Europe. He reports the sea was frozen solid in winter, allowing travellers to walk between the cities. Fishing continued during these months, when people cut into the ice with trident-shaped tools to retrieve large sturgeon. According to Strabo, the passage became an ice road in winter, that could be crossed using wagons. A general sent by the Pontic king Mithridates IV to defend the Crimea was said to have won a naval victory on the strait during the summer and a cavalry engagement in the same place the following winter. The Sea of Azov was known to the Romans as Moetos Lake and at its northern edge was the River Don which led deep into the Russian steppe. Arian considered the River Don to be the dividing line between Europe and Asia, but its northern reaches had never been fully explored by any Greek or Roman travellers. Writing in the late 1st century AD, Pliny described the population living along the Don as Sarmatians, who had expelled the native Scythians from the territory. There was a Hellenic trading city called Tanaeus, where the River Don flowed into the Sea of Azov. Strabo reports that Tanaeus was second only to Panticapaeum as the greatest emporium for Scythians and Sarmatians. Tanaeus was the most northerly and remote Greek outpost in the Black Sea, but its position offered unique trade opportunities. Merchants from Tanaeus dealt in mink and sable pelts, and Strabo reports that the nomads bring to Tanaeus their products including slaves and animal hides to exchange for clothing, wine and other things that belong to settled civilization. Pliny describes how the broad Crimean peninsula was surrounded by sea and its east coast consisted of low-lying land rising to large mountain ridges. Its population was diverse and included towns occupied by various native peoples, the descendants of Greek settlers and Scythian migrants from the steppe. Arian describes the sailing from Panticapaeum west around the Crimean Peninsula 
which the Romans called Taraka. About 42 miles from Panticapeum, there was a former Hellenic city named Chimericon, which had declined until it was little more than a village. Approximately 28 miles west from Chimericon, travellers passed the Greek city of Theodosia, which had also become depopulated when commercial activities were redirected towards other ports. Strabo describes this region as everywhere productive of grain and containing villages, and the old harbour at Theodosia could accommodate up to a hundred ships. These harbours might have remained in operation as places for ships to shelter from the violent storms from the north that affected this coast. Claudius Ptolemy records the presence of a military installation on the southern coast of the Crimea known as Charax, the fortress. This site can be identified with a Roman fort that has been excavated on top of the A. Todor Cape. The site, now known as Castrum Charax, was possibly established when the Emperor Nero temporarily made the Chersonensis subject to full Roman authority and placed the kingdom under the control of the governor of Moesia on the west coast of the Black Sea, AD 63 to AD 68. An inscription from Rome records how the governor of Moesia, Tiberius Plautius Silvanus, sent an expedition to the Crimea to defeat a force of Scythians threatening to invade the peninsula. The text records that he dislodged the king of the Scythians from the siege of Chersonensis, and was the first to add a great quantity of wheat from that region to the grain supply of the Roman people. Castrum Charax was strategically important, since it controlled sailing routes around the peninsula and occupied land near the shortest crossing point between the Pontus and the Crimea. In the 2nd century AD, the fort received garrisons from legions based near the Danube frontier. The remains at Castrum Charax include defences built using lime mortar, Roman brick-built bathhouses with clay heating pipes, a cult building, and altars with dedications to Jupiter and other Italian deities. The inscriptions include mention of military road builders who were probably tasked with improving routes to the main Crimean cities from the coast to Castrum Charax. These roads were probably planned for rapid military deployment, but would have facilitated transport and trade. Just beyond the southern tip of the Crimean Peninsula, archaeological work has uncovered the remains of city walls, defensive watchtowers, a Greek temple, a Roman amphitheatre, and ancient farmlands under civic authority. Here there was a thriving Hellenic city named Chersonensis that had its origins in a Greek colony established in the 6th century BC. Pliny reports that the city was encircled by five miles of wall, and its inhabitants preserved a culture that was considered the most Greek of all the cities in the region. Ships voyaging onward left the Crimean Peninsula and began sailing along the northwest shore of the Black Sea towards the Nyper Bug estuary. The Bug, Nyper and Don all formed important north-south migration routes for steppe peoples to move cattle and products between seasonal grazing lands. Some 30 miles west of Odessos was the mouth of the Nestor River and the site of former Greek settlements known as Iconion and Tyras. Rising in central Europe, the Nestor flowed through the Carpathian Mountains and formed the northern frontier of Dacia. Goods from across these regions would have reached Odessos, including valuable amber from territories near the Baltic Sea. The Roman orator Diochrysostom visited the Greek community at Odessos sometime between AD 96 and AD 101. He describes it as an important trading centre with a large number of salt works close to the Nyperbug estuary. It was a sheltered marshy estuary with slow-moving river outlets where the water level dropped below 12 feet. Consequently, ships could run aground in the summer months. 
Dyer warns it was a muddy shore, overgrown with reeds and trees, with many trees visible in the midst of the marsh, resembling the masts of ships. Pilots had to be alert, as sometimes the unfamiliar have lost their way by supposing other vessels were approaching. Greek communities on this part of the Black Sea had lost their autonomy when the Sarmatians overran the Pontic steppe in the mid-first century BC. Dyer reports that Sarmatians established a fortified outpost near the estuary known as the Citadel of Elector. When Dio visited the region, the citadel belonged to the wife of a Sarmatian king. Dio records that some of the Greeks no longer united to form cities, while others had a wretched existence as their communities were joined by numerous barbarians. Many Greek ships stopped sailing to the Nyperbug estuary because the Sarmatians had no people of common speech to receive the merchants, and had neither the ambition nor the knowledge to equip a trading centre of their own in the Greek manner. The new steppe rulers of Odessos managed to restore commercial traffic by permitting the Greeks to form a distinct community to manage the civic regulations and social networks favourable to visiting merchants. Nevertheless, Dio thought that Odessos was in decline, since the city did not match its historic reputation. This was due to its repeated seizure and wars, and the fact that the city had been in the midst of virtually the most warlike barbarians for a long time, and constantly in a state of conflict. By AD 96, many civic buildings in Odessos were in disrepair and the city had contracted to a small defensive area in one fortified stretch of its former circuit wall. Dio reports that few towers remain on the wall, and the current defences do not match the original size or power of the city. Dio describes how ancient ruined towers on the outskirts of the reduced settlement still remained. He saw the temples, shrines, and public buildings, but not a single statue remains undamaged in the sanctuaries, and all have suffered mutilation along with the funeral monuments. One practice demonstrates the strength of belief and superstition among Greek and Roman mariners who visited this region. Arian reports that there was a strange white-coloured island in the sea near the Nyperbug estuary that was sacred to the Greek hero Achilles. It was said that his mother, the nymph Thetis, gave the island to her son for exercise and training, and for this reason the place was known as the Island of Achilles, or the race track. The island was well known to Greek and Roman writers from this period, and Pliny had heard that Achilles might be entombed on the island. Arian confirms that the Isle of Achilles was believed to be a place of wonder, with a supernatural influence that extended into the surrounding sea. The island was uninhabited, except for a temple with an ancient wooden image of Achilles. Sailors visiting the island often captured a wild goat to sacrifice at this temple. It was said that the divine presence signaled its satisfaction by rendering the goat unresistant to the blade. A great deal of wealth had therefore accumulated within the temple because landing parties kept offering goods until the animal ceased its struggles. People made pilgrimages to the island but many ships that made unscheduled stops due to incoming storms used items from their cargoes. Arian reports that all manner of votive offerings decorated the unguarded temple, including ceramic bowls, jewellery rings, and expensive precious stones. Visitors to the site had carved inscriptions on the temple walls in Greek and Latin to honour Achilles and thank him for divine assistance. These inscriptions also honoured the legendary Greek hero Patroclus, a close comrade of Achilles in the Trojan War. There were a large number of wild birds on the isle, including cormorants and gulls. Arian heard that they flapped sea water from their feathers onto the temple paving stones every morning and cleaned the surfaces with their wings. Achilles was said to appear in dreams, and the crew aboard nearby ships had night visions 
giving them instructions about the best place to land. Sometimes Achilles appeared to sailors who witnessed an image of the hero on the sail or prow of their ships. Although Arian considered himself to be a practical man, he was unwilling to dismiss these stories. He had spoken to people who had landed on the island, and concludes, These things do not seem incredible to me, because I believe that Achilles was a divine hero and inferior to no one. The Black Sea coast continued south towards the marshy delta of the Danube River, which formed a major frontier of the Roman Empire. South of the Danube River, Moesia and neighbouring Thrace were lined with city ports, including Thomas, where the port Ovid was banished by the Emperor Augustus. Arian ends his account of the Black Sea at Byzantium, on the European side of the Bosporus Strait. This city was destined to become the new capital of classical civilization in late antiquity. And from this port, Greek and Roman ships carrying valuable Black Sea cargoes could once again enter the Aegean Sea and connect with the wider Mediterranean economy. To learn more about the ancient world, subscribe to my channel and follow the link to my books. The Roman Empire and the Indian Ocean and the Roman Empire and the Silk Roots. Thank you.